what they discovered is that they could generate such a strong energy field. Both of these cultures had the same advanced machining with these stones. We may not even be able to do today with the tools that we have available. Since ancient times, there have been venerated rulers depicted as having elongated heads. Some examples include the Egyptian god Osiris, who is a giant with an elongated head. And then in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, we find the king Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV. When you look in the Cairo Museum, do you see that not only is he depicted with an elongated head, but so is his entire family. The same is true in ancient Babylonia when we learn of the stories of Dagon, Nimrod, Oroanes. Uh, some call him Sidon because he taught the people about agriculture. But we get this idea of this god who's wearing a fish hat or an elongated head. And he has these fish scales because he was part of a seafaring people. Comes to the shore of a very primitive people and teaches them about how to make fires and have a society and builds them up from the ground up after the cataclysms. These were extraordinary people. We find the legends of them all over the world. And to a greater degree, we have also seen that this is what has created what we call artificial head binding or cranial deformation of primitive cultures trying to imitate what these more advanced civilizations were teaching them. So to find out more about this, I asked my very good friend, Brian Forster, to come on the show. He and I have traveled around the world and done conferences together. Uh, we've been to Egypt together. We've been up to Peru and Bolivia and all those places, you know, Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, Lake Titicaca. And I have seen his work and the incredible evidence that he has examined from all different sorts of scientific angles. And I want to talk about that with him today. But first... I want to tell you all about these amazing Oregon pyramids. And you can get them at Light the Light Pyramids. They're made by our very dear friend of the show, Michelle Hood. I love the way that they make the energy in the room feel. They're incredible. So do go and get yourself one. And also, I am taking my functional mushrooms that I always tell you about. And this time of the year, especially since it's cold and flu season, I'm taking the chaga. I'm taking lion's mane. And they're giving me a great boost. And I just can't say enough good things about them. You can get them at neurobuddha.com. And you can use the coupon code ENOC20 at checkout to save 20%. So, Brian, I want to jump right into this subject with you because we know that there are these other class of hominids that I believe in your testing, they have been called Homo sapiens sapiens paracus. They're a totally different class of hominids, and I want to get into that with you today. But how can we tell the difference between those folks that you're examining up in Paracas that we'll just call those the real elongated skulls uh, alongside the, the ones with cranial deformation? What's the, the easiest differences to tell in their characteristics? The ones that are the product of cranial deformation, there's no difference in the uh, volume cranial volume as compared to a normal Homo sapiens sapiens. But with the Paracas ones, the originals, their cranial volume is as much as 25% larger than normal. And I have an example I can show you. This is actually a, a cast of a probably seven-year-old child. And the important thing to show is the lack of the sagittal suture. You can see all Homo sapiens sapiens have a suture that goes across this way and connects with the occipital bone at the back. And this one doesn't have that at all. There's no sign that it was ever there. And so that indicates to us that this is not Homo sapiens sapiens. It also has these, also has these two little holes in the back of the head, which were for blood and nerve flow. So that also you do not find in uh, Homo sapiens sapiens in general. That's incredible. Now, Brian, when we look at the size of these skulls, what, what's really fascinating with this is that they have these enormous heads. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, there the, all these stories that we have of these ancient venerated rulers who had elongated skulls, whether we were talking about the depictions of Osiris or we talk about Dagon, who had the fish hat or the mitre, 
or we talked about Akhenaten. It, it appears that these beings. Oh, it's hey, it's uh, it's one of your puppies. What who what what's his name? That's Sonko. Sonko. The but yeah. when we look at these ancient venerated rulers that they all mm -hmm. seem to have some special ability attached to them, whether it was Osiris, whether it was Dagon, whether it was how Akhenaten was depicting himself. Mm -hmm. The question I want to ask is, do you think that they had extraordinary abilities due to the size of their brains? That Do you think that they could have had other capabilities that regular uh, Homo sapiens sapiens don't have? Um, I would think so, because when you have 25% larger cranial volume, it has to be for something. Some people have speculated that the skulls were larger, but the brains were the same size. But I've seen the insides of the original Paracas skulls, and you can see where all of the veins um, would actually make contact to the interior of the skull. And therefore, that tells you that the brain was the same size as the volume inter internal volume of the skull. So in the case of Osiris, of course, we have these depictions of him shown as being green and uh, also having either a hat or a head or a hat covering a head that seems to be much larger than normal. And then you have depictions, of course, of uh, Akhenaten that way. Uh, we don't have evidence of Akhenaten's actual existence, but what we do have is we have the busts that are located in the Cairo Museum of his daughters that are shown clearly to have had elongated skulls, not like the Paracas ones where it's vertical elongations, it's more of a horizontal elongation. But that would, in, because of the precision of the sculptures, that would indicate that it had to have been based on something or someone, not simply an artistic portrayal or fictionalization of something. Wow, that's really incredible. I remember walking through Tanis with you when we were there and you said something that really stuck with me. You said, hey, look at that uh, that statue over there that we see of Osiris. And you said, don't you think it's interesting that he's depicted as a giant with an elongated skull? What do you think of the idea that these folks with elongated skulls might not have been from here, that they evolved from elsewhere with a different type of gravity and a different type of birthing uh, due to the way that their heads are shaped? Well, there is, of course, a connection between Sirius and ancient Egypt. So it could be that Osiris is based on someone who came from the area of uh, of the stars of, you know, the Sirius uh, stars, quite possibly. I'm open, to, you know, I don't have evidence for that, but I'm open to the idea because, of course, Sirius and Osiris are very closely uh, related in terms of uh, letters. So I, I think it is a possibility. Of course, we do have the time called um, Zeptepe, or the first time in ancient Egypt, which describes ancient civilization that existed way before any aspect of the dynastic people. So that could be depicting the time of when the gods walked on earth with, with people. And that could, represent, could have been represented by Osiris and Isis being these first uh, people who came quite possibly from somewhere else other than our planet. I like that connection that you're making right there. And when we look at that name, Osiris, this is something that I, I've often heard, the connection that we found between Osiris and Sirius. Jordan Maxwell used to say that there was a connection to why we call each other Sir, and as a gentlemanly title, and that came from Sire, that went back to Osiris. And it was actually, I believe, Diodorus, in the Bibliotheca Historica in 50 BCE, that he makes a direct connection to the ancient name of Osiris to, to Sirius. And we find that connection right there. And normally we say, hey, there's an Orion connection. But I think that that's fascinating that you'd put those together. When we go back and look at these folks, there's all kinds of conspiracies about them, of course. And I'm not sure if you're familiar too much about what Karen Hughes had said, I believe she was associated with uh, some of the, the World Banks, and she had come out and said that there was another group uh, of these folks with these elongated heads that she felt were running the planet, and they were actually over at the Vatican. Did you ever see her talking about that? Oh, very much so. That was a few, at least three years ago. I was actually in contact with her for a short period of time in regards to that. That's her, you know, that's her theory or her speculation. I don't know 
she seems to have di disappeared off the off the internet since then so i don't know if uh if she's been harassed or what happened to her but uh that became quite a prominent theory a few years ago uh, absolutely it did and you know what's interesting is when we look in egypt as i i know you've looked all over the world at this and and i'm I, I think everyone would agree when they look at your work that you are the greatest expert in this area and you have the right background for it, you know, from coming from a biology background, you're a scientist, you you left everything, you moved to Paracas, you've been looking at this all your life, you've been involved in genetic testing for this, you take it very seriously, and I know you've looked at where this is all over the world, from the Northern Black Sea, Crimea, Scandinavia, the stuff you've said where you found the traces of these elongated skulls, the authentic ones, that is, not just the cranial deformation versions. But oftentimes we've speculated that there must have been these folks that were in Egypt. But according to you in the past uh, and others I've talked to, they said, well, publicly, we have nothing on record to say that we have ever found any uh, of these elongated skulls in Egypt. And I, I heard something recently that actually came from Steve Mara, who I know you're familiar with, the folks mm -hmm. over at uh, Zohar Entertainment, the UK. He has a friend that works at the BBC, and they were in Egypt in, in some of these tombs that they were going to unearth a new tomb, and they were looking in there, and apparently they were going to do this big BBC uh, expose on what they were finding, and it was going to be a big special. But apparently that all got shut down and it went hush hush after they had discovered some elongated skulls. Have you ever heard of anything like that in Egypt being suppressed? Oh, definitely. I think there are photographs in the Aswan Museum that show depictions of people with elongated heads from very early in the 20th century, like very old photographs of that. Um, so I know Yusuf Awiyan was the one who first showed that to me of evidence of, um, you know, the presence of elongated skull beings before dynastic times. So, you know, there is some credence to that, that theory. But of course, Egypt is one of the countries where so much information has been distorted or, or covered up by authorities because it's, they don't think that um, the world is ready to hear about it, of course, you know, and of course, all of the places that we've not been allowed to visit that recently have been opened up like the Osiris shaft and places. So there's, you know, I'm hoping that when they open the new museum, the Grand Egyptian Museum, this, you know, this coming year, I hope that they will have some items on display from their subterranean vaults at the Cairo Museum that will be of, of interest to those of us who are looking for uh, so-called alternative origins of the Egyptian people. Well, they've been saying that forever, haven't they, that they're going to open up, Jim. Uh, that will be great if they do it this year and not just have a parade, that uh, mm -hmm. an opening follows the parade. Uh, but it it is going to be amazing when they open it up. I, I wanted to bring it back a little bit to what you were just saying there. You know, when we talk about these elongated headed progenitors uh, and, you know, how they could be associated with our origins uh, going back into the story. If we look at the story of Dagon, Nimrod, or Oannes, who came to the primitive people of Babylonia, and he's depicted, as you know, with this fish hat or the, the mitre like the Pope wears, and he comes to the primitive people after the cataclysm, and he teaches them about agriculture and how to have a civilization. The same is true over in Egypt. You know, we talk about Osiris and what's on the Edfu story. But when we think of these guys as they're traveling around the world, whether they were missionaries after the cataclysms uh, or they were just on vacation to certain parts of the world that we find their remains, is it possible that when we look at the stories where you live, the stories of Viracocha, Amaru, and all these guys, that we have this story going over to Mexico, which I know you've talked about a lot. You've done tours to Mexico and you've covered all these parts in, in your work and your books. Uh, but when we look at the Yucatan and all that, do we find a connection with uh, Quetzalcoatl uh, or Kukulkan because we have them artificially binding their heads over there? Is there a connection that comes from Peru to there? I think so, because if you follow what's called the path of Viracocha that goes from the southeast into um into Bolivia 
and then towards the northwest, going through all of the megalithic sites that we find, like Machu Picchu and Sacsayhuaman and Oriente Tambo. Then if you keep following that line, it reaches the Peru-Ecuador border. And then when you follow it from there, because it said that, uh, you know, the, the, the Viracochans taught the people and then left. Um, if you keep following that line, it does wind up in Mexico and it goes through Yucatan and it goes through, I believe, quite close to Mexico City. So those are the locations where you find um, Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl. So I, it could very well be that the individuals who uh, were called the, the Wiracochan or the Viracochan, when they left Peru, they actually wound up and possibly changed their names to accommodate the local cultures in Mexico, the Mexico area. That's incredible. So there's there's a cross pollination of cultures. And it's rather fascinating that here we have these elongated heads depicted, but it's almost like our historians, our archaeologists, our academics have just shunned it. And when we look at the evidence up to this point, they've, they've tried to dismiss it. Have you felt any pushback from academia uh, or any of these areas when you've taken this testing uh, forward? Um, the DNA testing? Yeah. Well, it's been completely ignored by academia. We had um, the person who was in charge of the DNA testing was a Peruvian archaeologist because that was part of the negotiation we had. We had to have a Peruvian archaeologist in charge of the of the study. So he was the first person to get the actual results that showed a connection with the Black Sea area of Eurasia, not with, with indigenous people of the Americas and automatically he simply, he refused, or actually I waited for a month after he got the results and contacted him or actually physically went to his office to uh, to talk to him. And he simply said, the results don't match what I expected because he of course expected it all to match indigenous Peruvians. And then after that, we asked if we could do more DNA testing based on the collections of the Peruvian government, he said, absolutely not, because everything, uh, every sample you took was contaminated, obviously, which it wasn't. So that makes, makes perfect that, sense. Yeah. So basically that, that became the end of, of the DNA study. Um, I've made, of course, a number of videos and written some books with the DNA results, which are open to the, uh, the public to look at. And that's my audience. My audience is not academia. My audience is the inhabitants of planet Earth. I love that, that you brought this evidence and your research forth for everyone. When you, we look at the evidence for this, okay, let's just take a look at the typical theory we'd find for migrations, even when we look at North America and uh, it's these two continents. Uh, we look at the Bering Land Bridge, the Bering Land Strait. Uh, what what is the difference really that we find within the regular DNA that we'd find? Let's say we break down the Homo sapiens sapiens, and then we look at the people, let's say of Peru, the people of those areas where you are compared to these Paracas skulls. What is the difference there in the haplotypes? Well, in general, the haplo mitochondrial haplo uh, group or haplotype of um, of Peruvians is haplogroup B. So that relates to movement via the, the Bering Land Bridge. We also see traces of A, C, and D. But in the case of the Paracas, out of the 22 skulls we examined, only two of them um, showed the mitochondrial haplogroup B, none of A, none of C, none of D. And the relationship then is of similar elongated skulls of a contemporary timeline found in Eurasia, more specifically around Crimea and the Black Sea area. I think so that's again, fascinating. Thank you. Uh, well, the, the reason I find that really fascinating too, Bri, is that we have some interesting connections to those areas when we look at the Ural Mountains. There is the Daska Stone. There are these incredible stones these mega uh these megaton stones that we find that are visible up from space there that have 120 million year old fossilized seashells in them they found all kinds of strange things uh you know it's it's an area that's that's truly perplexing it has an ancient 3d topographical map of the earth 
again, visible from space. Uh, we have in the nearby areas all kinds of strange mythologies, and one I wanted to ask you about. When we look at the Bulgarians, for example, wasn't it you that told me, I think it was around the 16th century, that royalty had to marry into females that had elongated skulls? Was that something that you were saying before? Well, I wouldn't say it was something that was prized because in that area, uh, it, according to that time frame, there were people with elongated heads that lived in the area of, of Bulgaria. And the women were prized by other uh, noble families to marry into that group, group. Why? You know, that's probably lost in time, but that definitely seems to have been chronicled that these were very prized individuals for their specific bloodline. I, I could see that. I mean, there's certain groups in Europe when we look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for example, we see the Habsburgs. They have very uh, unique physical characteristics. There are some families, let's say, when we go look at England, without saying any names that are from, let's say, the area of Lincolnshire, that when you look at them today, they appear to have this elongated headed uh, cranial area. And I think it's a it's a symbol of prestige. And so uh, it's it's very interesting that that still remains here today. Would you say that there still are populations uh, in any, you know, concentrated amounts on the earth right now that still have the elongated heads? Um. Not really. I mean, there were people living in, uh, I think it's the Congo in, in Africa, that up until the 1950s, they were still doing um, head binding. But I think missionaries and the government um, decided that that was not a good idea and prohibited them from doing that. The Inca also had elongated heads. And once the Spanish conquered Cusco, they prohibited skull binding by them. So the um, you know the portrayals we see of the Inca made by uh, European painters is not a depiction of what the Inca actually looked like. The Inca also had reddish hair, were taller than normal, and also had lighter colored skin. That's what differentiated them from the uh, you know from the normal inhabitants of the Cusco Highlands of Peru area. That was shown by. Uh, one of the members of uh, Pizarro's, actually one of Pizarro's brothers noticed that when he was in Cusco. He he saw these people who looked quite different and said, who were they? And he was told those are the last of the Viracochans, the old ones. That's really fascinating. I know even in British Columbia, Canada, where it's interesting that people might not know this. I don't know if you want me to tell everyone this, but that no, good. You, you, you and I both come from British Columbia uh, originally. Now, of course, we don't live there any longer. You live in Paracas, I live in uh, Hungary. But even in those areas, in the Guadalajara Islands, I believe it is, and in these areas, they found skulls that people can look it up online that have been artificially bound with the cranial deformation. And there's so many people on the internet that will be quick to dismiss the discoveries of, let's say, the Paracas skulls or the authentic skulls out there. And they'll say, it's all, it's all artificial head bonding. Well, why do people think that this practice started in the first place? They were trying to imitate who they perceived as these holy people, these gods, or those with these incredible abilities. Obviously, they saw them and they said, well, we want to be like them. They were another class. And uh, when, we, when we look at these depictions, though, of the artificially bound ones, and you gave us a good breakdown at the beginning of the show, when we see where the spine would come in and the size of the head uh, mm -hmm. is th th is this is this clearly coming in to a different spot though on the base of the head? Well, very much so because it's called the foramen magnum. That is where the vertebrae enter the bottom of your skull. With us, it's it's at the middle. It's at the balance point. But in the case again with this casting of an authentic Paracas. Uh, young person, you can see that the foramen magnum is very much at the back. It's about two and a half centimeters back from where ours is. So that indicates that the whole balance of the skull was completely different than ours. Um, also, I think the diameter of the foramen magnum in the original Paracas is about half of what ours is. So their necks were very thin, probably very long. And so that's what uh, distinguishes uh, the original Paracas from 
us and from the people who had their head bound. And of course, as you said, the whole idea of head binding was based on copying someone or that existed before. In the case of the Caracas people, it was the mixing with the later Nazca culture that caused who were normal looking that caused the um, beginning of cranial deformation amongst the mix of Caracas and Nazca in order to maintain the look of the uh, original Paracas people. But over the course of time, that all died out. And eventually, the Nazca simply looked like a normal Homo sapiens sapiens uh, would look. That's really incredible to think about. You know, Bri, I will say that you have far surpassed Thor Heyerdahl and those who have gone into those parts looking at these mysteries. You've done so very respectfully. Uh, I've been to these parts with you when you've been into these areas of Peru and up into Bolivia, Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, and all these incredible parts. And, you know, so far when we look at this subject, some people like Dan Aykroyd have portrayed these elongated headed folks sort of in a cartoony fashion with the Coneheads movie. We have all sorts of different uh, ideas about them and what that represents. But moving forward, I think that our future generations will have you to thank for taking this so seriously and, and bringing this up in these incredible subjects. And you have also looked at this idea with these megalithic structures at the same time, but also these cataclysms, as you've put out there in your book, Aftershock, and you've been discussing for years. What do you think are the greater implications of of all this when you put it together when you've your work has looked at the cataclysms you've looked at megalithic structures you've shown that there's been advanced machining you've shown this group do you think that we will ever get a full picture of these prehistoric civilizations and who these people were in their global role well i hope so i'm very grateful that there are a number of um younger people who are making YouTube videos now, um, more or less looking at the same stuff that I've been looking at. You know, people like Un Ben of Uncharted X, Jimmy of Bright Insight, uh, Johanna James, uh, and others. And so I'm very, I'm very grateful that I've been able to influence them to some degree. And uh, I hope that they will, they and others will continue on with exploring and exposing the fact that our history is much more complex and longer than what we've been told, that there were very advanced civilizations with amazing technological capabilities that existed in the, you know, many thousands of years before the dynastic Egyptians or the Inca. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, as time goes on, that we'll have more and more of this information reinforced by people other than, than myself. Brian, I love that so much. And I want to thank you for coming on today and sharing with us about your latest findings when looking at these elongated skulls. And I'm going to put links down below where people can find your books and they can check out your tours and they can go, of course, always to Hidden Inca Tours and they can see what you got going on. But they can also find you on shows like Ancient Aliens and Gaia's Deep Space. And you always have a, a million other great projects going on. Uh, really quickly before you go, is there anything that we can look forward to that you got coming up? Well, we're going to Mexico in February with a quite a large group looking at um, evidence of lost ancient high technology at some famous and some not so famous sites like Teotihuacan, of course, is very famous. But there's another site called Mitla in Oaxaca that shows clear evidence of very advanced ancient technology. Then in April, we're going back to Egypt with quite a large group. Um, then in June, we have our uh, Peru-Bolivia tour, uh, which is more fo focused on the um, Inca celebration of the sun. But of course, we're going to be going to all the megalithic sites, including going back into Bolivia to Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. And then November, again, we're going to have another uh, Peru-Bolivia tour. I think that's going to be it for, for next year. I'm still waiting for um, stability. You know, there's still all of this um, minor chaos going on around the world based on, uh, you know, factors that we don't really want to discuss too much. But um, I'm, I'm waiting for more political and uh, 
travel stability before I start to open up to other places like going back to Turkey and uh, Lebanon and um, Jordan and places like that. And I Israel. think I think that 2023 is a great year for people to travel. I, I think it might even be a better year than 2024, 25, uh, because we're going through all kinds of new adjustments in the world and there's new systems in place, but this is a wonderful time for people to take one of these tours to get out there and to check it out. I mean, a lot of people want to get out and travel. They've been stuck in the house since 2020. So now's mm -hmm. the time to do it. Brian, thank you again. And I hope we can get you back in the future to discuss some of these other fascinating topics, such as ancient cataclysms, advanced machining, and all these megalithic structures you have looked at all over the world. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Do remember to like, subscribe, comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And I'll talk to you on the next episode.